So we've been in this sermon series for several weeks now um, called when The Church When We Gather, uh, and we've been talking about why we do all the things we do. And I tell you this every week because uh, a week is a long time to remember. So we, we are, this is what we're talking about, why we do the things we do. So why do we even gather? Like it's weird that a bunch of people come together at the same time and, uh, and do the same stuff. And so we, why do we do that? Why do we serve one another? Why do we pray together? Why do we sing together? Why do we preach? Why don't we just have a dialogue why do we uh, give? Why do we have communion? And today, we're going to end that series. Um, and then next week, we'll start one in the Psalms. And we'll talk about the Psalms and David's life and David writing songs about what's going on in his life. So it's going to be really fun next week. It's going to be good. Fun, fun, not the right word. It'll be good. Um, and uh, so it's going to be great. But today, we finish when we gather. So the last thing we do every Sunday is we scatter. We leave and we go in different directions. So we're talking about why we do that. We do that intentionally. Uh, we, we, per- we go out with purpose. There's a reason at the end of the service I now say, church, you're sent. Because we scatter with purpose. And there's two points today uh, about the scattering I want us to have. I'm going to just give them to you at first. So there's no wondering, what is this sermon about? Um, we scatter, uh, first of all, because Sunday isn't the only day of the week and and um, we, it's not, we don't call it the Lord's Day because all the other six days belong to us and God gets Sunday. Um, but so we scatter intentionally and we talk about why we go out because we go out and we live every single day under the face of God and in the presence of God. And so we don't just scatter. We don't just leave church and now, okay, I went to church and now it's my time. Monday's mine. Okay, well, Mondays, Mondays are horrible. Mondays are God. Tuesdays are mine. Wednesdays are mine. Fridays are certainly mine, right? That's not, so we, when we scatter, we scatter under the acknowledgement that everything belongs to the Lord. Every day belongs to the Lord. So we scatter with purpose. And then the second thing is that we scatter to spread and share the very good news we sing, celebrate, and hear on Sundays. So we come together, we sing about the good news, the gospel, we hear about it, we pray about it, we read it, and then we leave with purpose to share and to spread that with those around us, to push back what's dark in this world with the light of Christ. We read that from 1 John, we saw that this morning. So this is what we do what we do. Uh, So to to kind of build that case and to talk about what does that mean, okay, so exactly what do we do, we're going to be in Revelation chapter 2. Um, and then we'll go back to Matthew 28 at the end, okay? Revelation chapter 2 um, starts off with a letter to the church in Ephesus. I love the church in Ephesus. I probably love all the churches if I thought about it, um, and I probably should. But I just, there's, we know more about the church in Ephesus than any other church in the Bible. Uh, we just know so much about it. We see its birth in Acts 18 and 19. Um, Paul writes a letter to the Ephesians. It's called Ephesians. Um, Timothy, so you have first and second Timothy, Paul's writing a letter to the elder at the church in Ephesus. And I don't know if you know this, but but first John, second John, and third John are written by John, who's also on staff as an elder at Ephesus. So there's so much we can see from Ephesus, and we get to see its birth um, all the way to the end. And this is the last thing we hear about Ephesus is in Revelation chapter 2. So I want to read uh, this letter. Jesus pins this letter through John. And, and we're going to read it, and he's going to say some things he likes about Ephesus and the church. And then he's going to give them a warning and a threat. 
And that's, that's the letter. And so I want us to look at the things that Jesus says he likes about Ephesus. Because let's be honest, if Jesus says he likes something about a church, we probably want to do that, right? Like that seems like the right thing to do. If Jesus likes it, then we want to be about it. Amen? You guys are, it's, we just started. Are you guys, okay? <laughs> so we want to be about those things. And then um, also, we want to hear the warning and we want to listen to it. And so I want to look at this letter. It starts in Revelation chapter 2, starting in verse 1. Um, so this is what it says. The, the, to the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and who walks among the seven golden lampstands. That is like revelation, apocalyptic talk for Jesus, okay? It's no secret. We don't have to like decipher it. Everyone, it's just, it's Jesus. If you have a, one of those Bibles that has Jesus' words in red letter, uh, red letters, the next paragraph should be in red letter. If you don't have one of those, it's fine. You don't need one. I don't have one. It's all black. Um, but uh, someone once said, it's all meant to be red, um, which is really cheesy joke. I'm not going to say. Uh, <laughs> but I kind of said it. And then, uh, so this next paragraph is Jesus talking to the church at Ephesus through the pen of John. And he says, I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil but have tested those who called themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary, but th I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent, and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent." Yet this you have, you hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. So Jesus talks about some things that he likes in Ephesus. The first thing we see here is their patient endurance. He says, I know your works, you toil, and your patient endurance. So they endured patiently. Um, we have to understand the context because it would be quick for us to be like, yeah, we've got to endure patiently too. Like when the media makes fun of us, we have to endure. When uh, Starbucks, you know, doesn't make the Christmas coffee cup and we get all mad, we have to endure that patiently. That is not what was happening in Ephesus, okay? They were being murdered, they were being imprisoned, and their stuff was being confiscated. That's their endurance, okay? It looks different than ours, right? Like, like, we can't just read into it like, yeah, we got to endure like them. Like, what they were going through was different than what we go through, but very much the same of what a lot of our brothers and sisters across the world go through. See, one of the things we, we, we uh, miss, and, and I need you to hear this whole statement from me, okay, um, is that when we see in the Bible it says to, like, care for the those in prison, we often are quick to, like, let's go care for those in prisons, and we should, but the context of those letters and those writings were that our brothers and sisters were imprisoned, and they were imprisoned because they followed Christ. And so that's the, not that we should, let's not do prison ministry because that's not what they were talking about. No, no, no. We should absolutely bring the gospel into prisons. But we have to remember that our, like back then, they were being imprisoned just for following Christ. Like that was what like Paul, imprisoned, wrote some of his letters from prison because he was following Christ. And so this is the kind of patient endurance that they had going on. They had this endurance where uh, they were being murdered, their stuff's being taken from them, uh, they're being split up, they're being forced out of towns, like this is what they endured. So it's good, so we want to endure patiently. We also want to endure. Now I think a time is coming where the uh, church in America is going to experience a lot more persecution than it currently does, and if we're honest, I welcome it. I mean, the, the, the church historically does well under persecution. And where the church and the state begin to like, kind of meet, okay, we're like, the church kind of gets raised up to this elevation of its ruling and reigning like you see in, in the Middle Ages and you see in, uh, in, in, in times um, before and even after the Reformation, you start to see things just go really badly, really quickly. But under persecution, the church flourishes. Um, certainly things get smaller because it's no longer advantageous to become a Christian, right? Like back in the 50s, like if you wanted to be a good businessman, you should be at the First Baptist Church or First Methodist Church because if you weren't, people thought you might be worshiping Satan and we're not going to buy, you know, laundry detergent from you, right? Like that's what it used, but now it's like kind of starting to go the opposite. I think it's going to go more the opposite of that, um, and I'm, I welcome it. Like I think the church will flourish and thrive under that. We get to share in the sufferings of Christ. 
uh, then we also get to share in the power of his resurrection. And so um, come what may, but this is different than what we experience today. It may be someday we experience this, but right now we just don't. But still, there are things that we must endure patiently. There's tragedies in our lives that we must endure patiently. There's sickness and illnesses. There's uh, loss of loved ones. There are loss of jobs. Like, there are still things we should endure patiently. And if we're being honest, there might be times where you, uh, you have great loss because of your faith. You, being honest at work may mean you don't go far at work. Being honest at work may mean you caught, you know, people don't like you. And so, like, hey, there are times where absolutely we will suffer today. We should do so with patience. Jesus saw this in the church in Ephesus, and he praised them for it. The second thing um, that, that, that he liked was this. He says, uh, you have tested those who call themselves apostles and are, and, are, and are not and found them to be false. So he's saying, like, you, you have such theological and doctrinal uh, knowledge that you're able to see people who come in and say, hey, this is Jesus, this is God, and you're like, no, it's not. That's not Jesus. That's not God. This is what who Jesus is, and this is who God is. And they have this deep theological and doctrinal rootedness in the gospel in scriptures that they're able to see people who are teaching false gospels, teaching false teachings. Teaching false teachings? That's a thing. They're able to see that and say, no, 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 no. That's not what scripture says. That's not what Jesus taught us. That's not what's going on. And so uh, Jesus praises them for that. This place has good doctrine. And so far, man, I, I'm, I'm submitting my resume. Like, this is a place I want to be a part of. This is awesome. Now, obviously, if you guys were still here, like I wouldn't submit my resume. This is where I want to be. <laughs> but if you guys weren't here, uh, I, this is my next choice. Like e- of Ephesus, this is awesome. Man, they got good doctrine. They've got good theology. They, they are in, like the people there are going through suffering and they're enduring it patiently. And then it's not, it's not over. He also likes this. He says, um, yet this you have, in verse 6, you hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Now, we probably don't know who the Nicolaitans are, so let's, let's talk about it for a second. Uh, in Ephesus, there was this big, beautiful, massive temple, the Temple of Artemis. It's actually one of the um, wonders of the ancient world. It was this big, massive, beautiful place, and, and they worshipped the goddess Artemis. And, and the way in which they would do that um, is that it was through it was through temple prostitution and sexual acts, okay? So if there's kids here today, um, have a fun conversation on the way home explaining that, but uh, it'll be good for them and good for you, okay? Um, there is uh, temple prostitution going on, and there was this group of, of, of people who call themselves Christians who thought, hey, you know what? The Old Testament is the only scripture that outlaws or forbids temple prostitution. The New Testament doesn't forbid it at all. Like our current writings and, and Paul never, you know, like, so like, hey, you know what? I think this, we have freedom in Christ. Let, this is fun. This is, we're able to worship Christ however we, we want. So let's do it this way. And the church in Ephesus was like, no, 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 no. That's not, you can't, that's not, you can't do that. You can't worship like that. And Jesus says, I like that. I like that you stood against that. I like that you're not letting culture come into your church and, and, and determine the way in which you worship. I like that you're not letting culture press in and change you in a sinful way. So, the, I mean, this is, this is a pretty cool sounding church, right? Here's the terrifying thing in verse 4. But I have this against you, Jesus says, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. What's terrifying for us, and should be, is we could have, a church could have good doctrine, sound doctrine, incredibly smart theologically. They could endure all the sufferings of this world and persecutions. They could press against culture instead of being shaped by culture, and they could not love Christ. That's, that should be terrifying for us. Because this is a church, like, we love orthodoxy, we love Christian faith, we look back towards uh, early church history, and this is, we believe the creeds, like, like, the, like, we love that stuff here, we love, we have a free library for you to learn, like, we love doctrine and theology. And it's terrifying to think we could love it, and we could know it, and we could be a smart, sound church, but not love Christ, and Christ say, I want to remove my presence from you. Because that's his threat. 
is if you don't turn back to your first love, if you don't go back to the things you did at first and remember where you have fallen from, then I'm out of here. I'm leaving. That's terrifying. And so what I want to do is I want us to go back and look at where Ephesus was. Where did they fall from? Um, and it's an incredible story. Uh, it's, it's, you find it in Acts 18 and 19. We're not going to read through it because we just don't have that kind of time. Uh, I was told by, uh, I went over last time by the kids people, and it's a whole thing. But uh, we're going to go through it, and we're going to chat about it, and it's really, really good. So Ephesus is this, is this city, um, and, and so Jesus says to go, we just read it in Matthew 28, go therefore make disciples, so people start going, okay? And this guy named Apollos goes to Ephesus and starts preaching the gospel and teaching the word. Um, and he's doing a pretty good job. Uh, it's not all good. And so, uh, you know, Priscilla and Aquila, they pull him aside. I'm like, hey, Apollos, do, love what you're doing. I think it's fantastic. You're missing some things. Here's some, like, here's what Jesus and here's what Paul said. Like, like, you know, let's fix this. So Apollos takes it, goes back out, preaches again. Um, Paul comes into Ephesus, starts teaching. He's like, hey, you guys, you guys got the Holy Spirit? And they're like, we don't even know who the Holy Spirit is. Like, what? Paul's never told us that, so Paul's like, oh my gosh, okay. Uh, okay, here's the Holy Spirit. So like, he starts doing works. This is going to make some of us super uncomfortable. And I'm just going to say, like, this is just the Bible. You can, Acts 18, 19. Paul starts doing some amazing works. Um, he's casting out demons. He is healing people left and right. People are literally sick. People just trying to touch his napkin and getting healed. I don't know what kind of stuff God's done in your life or through you. Uh, no one's done anything except probably get sick touching my napkin, okay? Like, I, my napkins have the opposite effect of Paul's. Um, but this is the kind of power that Paul walked in. And this is the stuff that Paul was doing in Ephesus. But that wasn't the spark that changed Ephesus. Um, the spark that changed Ephesus is found in Acts 19. And um, I'm just going to be honest with you. Uh, it is incredible. And it's a really true story, okay? We believe this is true. But you have, um, you know, Paul's casting out demons. Everyone's getting excited. And so there's this Jewish itinerant uh, exorcist. It's a real job title. You can Google it. Uh, he's a Jewish itinerant exorcist. He's got seven sons. And his name's Sceva. So seven sons of Sceva. They're like, man, we want to be like Paul. Paul's casting out demons. So they decide to go out and start, like, finding a demon-possessed man. Well, they found him. And they said to this demon-possessed man, in the name of Paul's God, Jesus, come out, okay? So they're pretty stoked. Uh, the Bible says the demon speaks to them. And what he, what, what, what he says is, 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 not making this up. He says, Jesus we know, Paul we've heard of. Just real quick, like that's crazy, right? Like, <laughs> like Paul's just wrecking stuff so much. The demons are like, well, yeah, you know, we know Jesus. Definitely, he was there from the beginning since we got started. Uh, Paul, we got a memo about. He's doing some crazy stuff. Is he here? He's not here, right? Like, are we going to be okay? <laughs> and, then, and, then, and then they're like, but who are you? We don't know who you are. And, and then the Bible says that the man leapt on them and overpowered them so much that they were naked and bloody. Okay? This is what happened to these seven men. Um, I, I, in high school, before I was a Christian, maybe even a little afterwards, I was, God was working on me. Um, I got in some fights, okay, and people got in fights, and in high school, everyone always argues about who won the fight, because the fight never lasts long enough for someone just to get pummeled, someone always comes up and breaks it up, right, so it's like, oh, I got a good shot, and no, nah, dude, you got beat, you got two hit, so everyone's arguing, a good rule of thumb is, is if you enter a fight with pants on, <laughs> and by the time it's over, you're no longer wearing the pants you had, you've lost the fight, and you've lost badly, okay, and so one dude beats up seven dudes, bloody and naked, and then it says the gospel just took off. Fear fell upon the people, and they turned to the Lord. Here, let's, let's pick it up in Acts 19, um, starting at uh, verse 17. And this became known to all the residents of Ephesus. What became known? The, the bloody, naked fight. Both Jews and Greeks, and fear fell upon them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. Also, many of those who are now believers came, confessing and divulging their practices. And a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted the value of them and found it to be 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. So what was the church of Ephesus like? I mean, 
Um, and, and then right after this, uh, so you have all this stuff happening, the fear of the Lord, people are burning their witchcraft books, and the word of the Lord is prevailing mightily, and then there's these dudes, and then right in the next, the next chapter, these dudes are building these uh, temple idols, and they're selling them so you can worship, you know, these gods. And um, I've shared this part before with you guys, that, you know, people w- weren't buying these idols anymore. So these guys, this is how they were making money. So they get upset, they're like, they get together, they get like a little group together, um, and they're like, hey, uh, this guy, these, 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 the, they call it the way back then. It wasn't Christianity. It was called the way. They're like, the way, they're, they're, they're messing with our money. Like, we're not, I can't feed my kids. I can't feed my wife anymore. My savings account's dwindling. Like, what do, like let's, let's go. Let's go wreck this thing up. So they get together, and they, they storm the theater in Ephesus, and they start a riot and just start rioting because they're no longer making money through sinful ways. Imagine with me just for a second, okay? Got to be careful what I say on tape here. Um, it's not tape. I don't know why I say that. It's definitely digital. We're not making tapes back there. Um, we got to be careful. I, I have a dream uh, that the gospel so penetrates Spruce Pine, Burnsville, the 828, that people who make math and deal math start rioting because no one's buying it anymore. Like, wouldn't that be amazing? And not because people just be put in jail, but because the gospel's going out, people are changing, they just don't want it anymore. They know Jesus is better, so like, I don't want that. And then they're mad because, and I, I, I do want the gospel to come to them too. I don't want them just to riot and stay mad. Like, I'd love for the gospel to penetrate their hearts. But like, imagine what Lower Street and Upper Street would look like, or the square in Burnsville, if like, just all these methods are like, let's go get them, and they like, storm the streets because they're angry because no one's buying it anymore. Like, what happens in Ephesus can happen in Spruce Pine, and that's my dream, and it's my prayer. And so I want us to look at what Ephesus was like at the beginning, and I want us to hear the warning. I don't want us to not hear the warning of Christ in Revelation. So let's look at Ephesus and see what they were doing. Uh, The first thing we see is they were extolling the name of Jesus. How many of you guys have used the word extol in the last week? Anyone? Okay, I didn't know. I don't know what it means. I had to look it up. Extol means to praise enthusiastically. To praise enthusiastically. Now, let's be careful not to churchify this, okay? Um, because when we think about praising, what do we think about? Singing, right? We're like, oh, I'm going to the praise and worship band. We're going to the praise. We're going to praise. We're going to sing. Uh, these dudes weren't singing yet, okay? They, they didn't know the songs. They didn't have the hymn books. They didn't have no projector. They weren't singing. So, yes, praising Jesus' name is absolutely through song, but it's not just through song. Like, it's out there, too. And I don't mean in your car, in your shower, singing. I mean just like on your lips. You're praising the name of Jesus enthusiastically. So we want to be and need to be a culture where Jesus is extolled, where his name and his fame is praised enthusiastically, not just in here, especially out there. I mean, you're going to lunch, talking about Jesus. You, people are like, hey, how was your weekend? Oh, man, it, it was hard, but man, Sunday was awesome. I love learning, teaching, hearing about Jesus. Like, Jesus needs to be on our lips. So for the Grove, uh, a cool pallet sign that we had made that says it's all about Jesus can't just be a pallet sign. It can't be a tagline, makes us hip and cool for the pictures. It's got to be a reality for us. We've got to be about Jesus and praising his name enthusiastically. Won't that make us seem weird? Yes. It will absolutely make you seem weird. God help them, other Christians will think you're weird. But if you think about it, you are absolutely weird if you believe this stuff. Has anyone ever told you what you believe back to you if you're a Christian? Uh, we believe there was this virgin who gave birth to a baby boy. Weird, right? Like, just not possible. Uh, And that boy was 100% human, but also 100% God and 100% man, but not all of God, just the Son, but he is all of God, but the the Trinity, like, it's, so we have this God, and he's man, and this man's God, and they're they're, they're one and the same, and, and, and then he lived this perfect life, never sinned once, and they killed him for it. And then they buried him, but he didn't stay buried. He came back alive three days later. He taught for some time. Then he floated off into heaven. And then someday he's coming back on a white horse to bring us all back with him. You want to come? Like, that's our, that's our story. And it's 100% weird. So, so right now, what I, I need you here to settle in your heart. 
are you okay being weird? And I'm not just like, we're not going to play Jesus Freak after this, okay? Like, it's just like, I don't like that song. I'm not a big DC Talk fan. Uh, it's not because I think their lyrics are bad. It's just musically, I'm just not impressed. Um, but, like, we've got to get to a point where we're okay being weird. If we ever make the gospel, like, sane enough and cool enough to be accepted, it's no longer the gospel. It's something other than that. So we can't, like, you've just got to decide, am I going to be okay being weird? Because if you're not, you're probably either A, and I love you, maybe not a Christian, and that's a good conversation for us to have, because you've decided, I don't really believe that, because it is weird, and if you do believe it, you've got to realize you're weird. We're a peculiar people, the Bible says. And, or, or B, you're just walking in some disobedience, man, I'd love to help. I'd love to help. Like, we're going to be weird. And like I said, I think other Christians are going to think we're weird if we're doing this right. So we need to have a culture where we extol the name of Jesus. The second thing we see here is that they're divulging and confessing their practices. So we have these uh, witches or, or, and, and, and wizards or whatever you want to call them. They're practicing magic arts. This is real. They're bringing their books together and they're burning them. I'm not a huge fan of book burnings. I think this one was okay because it's in the Bible. Uh, but they're like burning these books and getting rid of these books because they're, they're confessing and divulging their practices. Just imagine with me for a second what the church at Ephesus must have looked like in the early days. You have these ex-witches and wizards coming together, in each other's houses, breaking bread together. Like, it looked pretty messy and weird, right? Like, it wasn't like they just became, like, 100%, you know, uh, saved, sanctified people. Like, they were being sanctified over time. So you had these witches and wizards, people who, who, were, who were literally, you know, going by in temple prostitutes the day before, and now they're coming to Christ. Like, the church had to look messy and grimy. The Grove Church has got to be a place that's messy and grimy. Or if we're honest, I don't, I don't want to be here. Like, I have no desire in my heart to pastor a clean, tidy church. It's just not in me. It's not the way, God, I'm, not, I'm not dogging clean, tidy churches. It's just, it's just, God didn't wire me that way. He didn't create me to do this. I just feel this angst in my bones that I want the people on the fringes and the messes and the griminess to come in to this family. And so we're going to look grimy and messy. And that needs, like, to be okay with us. Um, one of the reasons uh, we do this at home groups, w when we scatter, we go to people's houses throughout the week, and we have people share their stories. And those stories are messy, and they're grimy, but they're stories of God's grace. And, 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 and most of them aren't that long ago. So, so when I planted this church, um, to go back to the weirdness and the confession, um, is I had this dude who I loved. I didn't really know yet, but I loved. And, and, and he thought of me too weird. He's like, this guy, I didn't tell him at the time, but he thought, he said, this guy just talks about Jesus too much. Like, he, he doesn't even take food into movie theaters because of Jesus. I don't even understand how that works. I'm like, we can talk about that later. It's a, it's a conviction of mine, not bringing food into movie theaters. Um, but he, he's like, he's just weird. Like, I don't know if I can talk to this guy. But then something snapped in his life, and his life began to fall apart. And who did he call? He called me. He took me, he took me out to, to, to dinner um, at Tokyo when Tokyo was on Upper Street. And he starts confessing um, adultery and pornography addictions in his life. And I'm like, I'm, I'm excited. But I'm also like, hey, man, there's kids trying to get ice cream right next to us. You want to turn that down a tad? Like, this is getting a little graphic. Just turn the volume down. Like, let's keep talking. Let's, maybe let's go outside. Um, but he's confessing and divulging his practices. And, and, and that, that dude still with us today loves Jesus. He looks cleaner today than he did back then. But man, our church was messy. The, the first home group had 13 people in it, and almost every man confessed a pornography addiction, like at home group in front of their wives. People are crying, snot, tears, all of it, just coming out over food. It's disgusting. But it was amazing to see what God would do when people, when there's a culture of confession. And so we build that into our, into our culture on purpose. Um, we, we, we do a time, I, I step to the side, normally I'm still in front of it, for some of you guys, I've, I've been told, so I'm going to try and get over to the side more. We do that confession part after the first song. That's not just for funsies, and let's read the Bible together. It's to remind us every Sunday that we are sinful and we're messy people. 
and we're, I want us to keep being messy. Now, now, now listen to me. We're not to um, uh, praise our messiness and be excited and stay in it, okay? It's not that we revel in our messiness. We say all the time, I stole it from the village, we say all the time that it's okay not to be okay. And th- that's true. We've got to be a place where it's okay to not be okay. But what do we always say after it? It's not okay to stay that way, right? It's okay to not be okay, but it's not. So like, we want to see people grow and grow in holiness. And so that brings me to the third thing we see in Ephesus here. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. People are finding victory over stuff. To prevail, to win over, to conquer. You got people playing with witchcraft and things that I believe are really real things where deem, you're opening up your, your heart and your soul and your house to demonic powers that I believe are real. Just see it in scripture. You're opening yourself up to that. And I'm not, I'm not sure that Christians can be possessed, but I think you could be uh, really oppressed by things. And you're opening yourself up to that. But what we're seeing is the gospel, the word of the Lord is prevailing and breaking those ties, breaking those bonds, breaking people's bonds of sin in their lives and sinful behaviors and patterns. God's word is winning over those things and people are growing in holiness and they're growing in godliness and because the word of the Lord is prevailing over those things. And so when we think about our messiness, um, we, we don't want people to stay in the messy and griminess of their lives. We want them to grow. We want them to grow. But we, we, what we need is more messy people to come in. Like we want to see more mess. Like they, so this is what we have at the Grove. Uh, at the Grove, there, there's um, r- like lately it's been about 100 to 110 people on Sunday morning between the two services, okay? Um, there's several, maybe even dozens maybe, people here who's just, they're, they're committed. Their yeses are down. Like whatever the Lord wants, I'm in. Like whatever he says, I'm doing it. If I need to give stuff up, if I need to go somewhere, I'm in. Just tell me what the Lord wants me to do. And it's awesome. And you guys are helping steer this ship. Um, you're helping us serve. It's, it's amazing. Th- then, there's, then there's probably another couple dozen who are like, man, I really want to be in, but I'm struggling with some stuff. Like, I really want to, like, just, just be all in, but I, there's just some baggage in my life. Like, it wasn't that long ago. I'm still trying to figure stuff out. I'm hurt. I'm broken. I just got stuff. And, like, man, you're not a bad person. You want to do well, you want to jump in, and you just need to be discipled and mentored and come alongside and loved and cared for well. And, and then there's probably some, some here, or there's definitely some here who come here because, like, our music's pretty good, and sometimes Zach makes a funny joke, and like, I feel good about myself when I leave here because like, I know I'm supposed to go to church, so i got to go somewhere, and this one, you know, this one's okay. And, and, and you're kind of on the outside, and then and there's people here who just get dragged here uh, by their spouse or their neighbor, or someone just handed them a, uh, an invite card, like, you better come or I'm going to be mad at you, you know. Um, and so, like, or, you know, hey, I love the old bait and switch, like, hey, we got food, you want to go to breakfast on Sunday? And then, like, hey, let's meet here, because, like, we, we, don't, we don't look like a church. Like, oh, yeah, breakfast is upstairs. Like, that's my favorite one. Um, and then they come upstairs, and it's like a whole church service going on. And there's food. They're not lying. There's really food. Um, but you get dragged here. And, and so, so because we have those layers here at the Grove, man, it's always going to look messy. It's always going to look grimy. But what's happening, and it, and it is happening, and we want it to continue to happen, is the people at the center who are helping steer, serve, love, and care for are bringing people in closer. And so people are becoming from the outside to the inside. And as you move towards the inside, in the center of this thing, you start to grow in holiness and godliness and maturity and your knowledge of the Lord. Um, and so we're pulling people in. So, but here's what that means is it's always going to look messy on the outside. Because as the messy people, now, now here's the thing. We don't want the same people staying messy. But, you know, them, them come in and they start growing in godliness, but they're bringing their messy friends in and their grimy friends in. And it just looks awesome. But this is how it's going to look at the Grove. And if that's not for you, I love you, but maybe this isn't the place for you. Because we're going to look like that. We're going to have people smoking downstairs and that's not even, like, a thing I care about that much. I, I don't, look, I don't want secondhand smoke. I don't want secondhand vape. Like, I think it's all kind of gross. My mom smoked growing up, and I just didn't like it. But I don't care. And, like, I've, we've, like early, we haven't got this in a while, so I'm going to be fair. But early on, some people cared. And I was like, well, you know, that's, that's too bad. <laughs> like, I don't care. Um, we have some people who've straight up said, hey, you know what? Uh, I don't want to go to that place because so-and-so goes there. 
and my immediate reaction was like, oh, thank God. Like, I don't know if I want you here, like, with that attitude. Uh, but then I have to repent because the gospel's for that person, too, and not just for the, the gospel's not just for the prodigal son. It's also for the older brother. Um, and so I got to repent for that. But, like, that's like, like, this thing's going to look messy. There's going to be people coming here, doing all sorts of stuff. People who are, you know, like, if we're like Ephesus, you sh- we could have, we could, we don't, I don't know, maybe we do. We could have people who just yesterday were dabbling in witchcraft. And now they're here at the Grove. So that's going to look weird, right? This is what I want for us, guys, is for us to look like that. Um, and so, and so he, he, here's the thing. Um, how do we get there? How do we do that? Um, I think one is, like I said, we've got to extol Jesus' name. We have to build a confesh- uh, culture of confession. And we have to build a, confe- uh, a culture of holiness. Uh, and what I mean by that is we have to uh, really intentionally draw people to holiness and to grow in their walk. Because here's what happens at churches like ours who love the messes. Uh, you have a guy come, and he's like, man, I got a pornography addiction. I've been looking at stuff this week that I shouldn't be looking at on the computer. I don't know what to do. And then guys gather around like, man, here's a book to read. It's super short. I know you can read this. Let's talk about it. every chapter. Let's pray. Let's do this. We can got it. And then the next week, dude comes back to the group. He's like, man, I messed up again this week. He's like, oh, yeah, I know. We all messed up. Everyone messes up. Every, who, who, everyone raise your hand if you messed up this week. Everyone like, aren't you the group leader? Should you be? Okay, okay. All right. Everyone's messing up. You know, like everyone's messed up. But no one's growing in, hol- in holiness or godliness because we're not pressing in and, and, and really learning what's actually going on. Instead of just saying, hey, stop looking at porn. We're saying, hey, why are you looking at it? Because there's, like, look, if, if you don't know, like, there's a, there's a bunch of reasons why a man might look at stuff like that. Or a woman might look at stuff like that. It's not all just, you know, lust. There could be just some, some deep-rooted things from their past, from their childhood. That could cause things, so, hey, wh- why are you looking at this? And then, and then we have to know the gospel well enough to press in and to apply the gospel at Sexual Life and show them why Jesus is better. Why what they're looking for on that computer screen is found in Christ and Christ alone. So this is how we grow in this way. But as we do that, we want to bring more and more people in to keep growing. Because here's the thing. Um, I am for church growth. And I may make uh, some enemies of me, people who are like, it's not about growth. But look, we want to see more people come to Christ, Right? Or do we not? Like, are we, are we just done? Or is this it? Are we closing the door? Like, we got enough people? No. We want to see more people come. And so it leads me to this last part, Matthew 28. If we're really going to extol the name of Christ, confess, and grow in holiness, we need to be about what Christ has commanded us. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed. Matthew 28, 16. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. This has nothing to do with today's sermon, but I love this verse, okay? Real quick. Disciples are seeing the risen Jesus. So Jesus died, buried, raised again, seen him on a mountain, and they're doubting. Don't be so hard on yourself with your doubts. People who literally saw Jesus after death doubted. I'm not saying it's good. I'm saying don't, just don't, don't look down and navel gaze and be sad that you have doubts. Look up, look to Christ, and trust him, okay? Don't look down on yourselves for that. Some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Um, I love that line because it's, it's really comforting because it means whatever Jesus is asking us to do next, we're going to be able to do. All authority on heaven and on earth has been given to him. So whatever he's going to say next is true, and it's going to happen. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of, age, of the age. So, so Jesus tells us to go. And I think we hear this passage, like, yeah, I know. No. Like, no one here is probably surprised we're supposed to go talk about Jesus, Right? Like, if you grew up in any sort of church background, you've been a Christian for a long time, like, no one's like, I didn't know I was supposed to tell people about Jesus. I thought this was just for me, and I was supposed to just keep it secret. Like, no, we all know that, but the question is, how do we do it? Oftentimes, this passage is used to talk about missionaries and going off overseas. Yes and amen, we should go overseas, we should go to Guatemala, we should go to Africa, we should do all these things. God has blessed the church in America uh, in a way that we can uh, be a, a missional hub to get people over to other places. I'm not saying we're better than those other places. He's just given us the f- some financial freedom to allow people to send people. So we should do it. Go overseas. But there's this sense in this passage 
that it's not just go, but as you go, as you go about your life, make disciples. Wherever you find yourself, make disciples of all nations, baptizing the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and, comm- and teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. So we should be doing this. And if we, if we really believe that Jesus has all authority on heaven and earth, and then he told us to do this, then we should believe that we will be successful in doing this. That we will be able to make disciples. It may take a long time. Our growth may be slow from here on out. But we should, I mean, maybe there's like, actually like a numerical, there's no growth. Like that. People leave in, people die in, people move in. Uh, but then we see new people coming in. But there should be new people coming to Christ. In any place. Maybe even if it's just one a year or one every couple, like people should be coming to the gospel. The gospel will save sinners like you and like me. So we go and we know God's going to add. We know the word of the Lord will prevail mightily. And so we preach it and we talk about it. So how do we do it? Because I think our issue isn't that we don't know that we should, but how do we do it? Because we need to do it. God has commanded us. I don't want us to end up like the Ephesians because here's the reality. In Revelation, Jesus writes this letter saying, if you don't repent and go back to the old ways, then I'll remove my lampstand from you. I will remove my presence from you. That's the last we ever hear of the Ephesians. It seems like maybe they didn't repent. It seems like maybe they didn't go back to their old ways. In fact, the city of Ephesus is one of the largest archaeological sites in the world today. It was just a mound not that long ago. I don't want us to end up like the Ephesians. We have to go back to what they did. Stolen Christ's name, confession and divulging practices, and growing in holiness, letting the the word of the Lord prevail mightily. And 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 then really what Jesus commanded us to do was to make disciples, commanding to do those things. So how do we do it? How do, as we go, how do we do it? We have this really cheesy acronym I use, okay? I'm just going to put it out there. It's cheesy, all right? But it works, and it's helpful to remember, okay? It's called BLESS, B-L-E-S-S. Super cheese, but it works, and that's kind of like the, the sphere I live in, cheesy but works, okay? Um, and so that's what we're using. It's not mine. Stole it. Uh, from Canada, I think, of all places. God love them. Um, And I'm just kidding. I love Canada, probably. I've never been there, so I don't know. Uh, Bless. B-L-E-S-S. The B stands for begin with prayer. There's two sides of this. Uh, um, The the first side is to pray for for the people that, you know, you might be talking to Jesus about, okay? Uh, That's that's part of the bless. I want to add something to that today. Um, We just need God's help. Like, we need the Holy Spirit. So, so if you actually read the story chronologically, Jesus tells his disciples to go and make disciples, right? Go and make disciples. And then in Acts, like, almost immediately after this, he says, but don't, you, you don't go right now. you got to wait for the Holy Spirit. Like, you better get up in that room and lock yourselves in and wait for the Holy Spirit to come down. Because if you try and go and make disciples without him, this whole thing's going to fall apart. So wait for the Holy Spirit. So today, we have the Holy Spirit. We don't have to wait. There's no locking ourselves in a room and waiting. We've got it. The Holy Spirit is poured out on the day of Pentecost, and we get it. But we pray and ask for help. God, lead me. God, send people to me. God, send me to people. Like, just ah, begin in prayer. If you want to follow the commands of Christ and make disciples, ask God to help you. It's really that simple. Ask God to help you. And then begin to pray for those God has put in your life already. The E stands, or the L, sorry. I know how to spell. The L stands for listen. Just listen to people. Uh, Sharing Christ isn't just all talking. Part of it's acting like Christ and listening. Listen well. Be slow to speak, quick to listen, James says. So listen. Ask questions. Hey, how's your day? How's work? Uh, the other thing about listening and, and, and praying uh, is beginning in prayer, going back to that, uh, one of the cool things you could do that's going to scare the, scare the poop out of some of you guys um, is just pray with people. Like, I know this is scary, but just oh, hear me out. I've never experienced someone who said no if you say, hey, can I pray for you? Like, even, even like, witches are going to be like, okay, yeah. Like, people just want to be over with as quickly as possible because it's awkward. So they're going to say, yeah, just to get it over with, okay? But, like, think about the kind of conversations that could be had and the relationship could be had if you start your relationship with someone with prayer. Like, you got, you, if you've been to uh, a, a restaurant 
that has a waiter or a waitress just seems like they're having a horrible day. Anyone ever been there? Yeah, a couple of you guys, not in Spruce Pine, maybe Burnsville. Seems like a Burnsville thing. And then you go to a restaurant and you're like, man, this person's having a horrible day. What if you just like, hey man, it seems like you're kind of down. Can I pray for you? Is there anything I can pray for you about? Yeah, like what, like what could happen if you tried that? Just try it. Let's just try it. Let's see what happens. Uh, if, you, if you do try it, let me know what happens. I think it's going to be really cool. Some of you guys aren't even like praying out loud. Now you're praying one-on-one with someone you just met. You don't even know. Um, just, just try it. See what happens. Begin with prayer. But listen. Listen to what they say they need prayer for. Listen to people's lives. Ask questions. Hey, how's your day? How's this? How's work? Just listen to people. You need to know how the gospel can be specifically applied to their lives. And the way you know that is by listening. The E stands for eat. Eat. Just eat with people. Um, that one's fun. Really good. A lot easier than praying with them. Right? Um, just go to a meal. Go to coffee. I know you don't eat coffee, but we have to have an acronym and C doesn't fit. So uh, eat. Go have breakfast, coffee, drink. And just have a meal. It's a lot easier to listen during that time. Okay? Something just about food just opens people up. The first S is serve. When you listen and you eat with people, you're going to find ways you can serve them. You're going to find ways that you can love them and serve them. And so serve. If you, someone has a hard time, um, you know, taking their trash out or needs their uh, a room painted or needs something done, just like, hey, I can help with that. Serve people. Be the hands and feet of Jesus while you're listening. The last S stands for share your story. I know it's S-Y-S, but it's just one S. Share your story. It's the second reason we always share our stories at home groups. I love people sharing their stories at home groups. Some of y'all share your story for like 40 minutes, and I think it's fantastic. Um, One of the things I want us to learn is how to share a story in like five to seven minutes, Okay. Some of us just had a panic attack, like, oh my gosh, I don't know if I could do that. Okay, well, let's work on it together. I think at home groups, if you, sh- if you need to share more, share more. But um, some dude you just met over coffee isn't going to hear your story for 40 minutes, okay? Um, so let, let's, let's learn to share it in five to seven. So just random numbers. You can go shorter or a little bit longer. But to and, and kind of like raise up 30,000 foot view of your story uh, Jesus is the central hero. He saved you. How has he saved you? What does he do in your life? Like just be able to share the gospel through your story in a, in a short amount of time. Uh, or maybe you just do it in bite-sized chunks. Maybe you like go out to a meal regularly with someone. You share your story in bite-sized chunks. I don't know. But the thing about sharing your story that makes it so simple and effective is that no one can argue with it. It's your story. It's happened. It's real. It's true. Share your story because no one can go like, no, 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 that's not right. God didn't do that for you. And they could think that, but it's your story. So share it. Share your story with people. We, we, we want to be people, this is going to be cheesy, but just bear with me, who bless our community. And I, really, I, li- I mean that's in the acronym too. We want to pray for, listen, eat, serve, and share this, our story of how God has changed our life with them. I really want us to see the story of Ephesus. It's an amazing story. Um, it's just an incredible story, and, and I really believe God can do stuff like that today. That God could turn an entire city, a town, community upside down in a way that's just amazing. So let's look at it as an example to follow in the early years and a warning to heed in the later years. The letter in, in Revelation is about 60 years after the church was planted. Um, so they had a really good run, and it's good. But let's heed that warning. Let's have a legacy uh, of people who extol Jesus, who confess to my vulgar practices, and who grow in holiness through the word. Um, and, and we go out and bring more and more people in that we would never look clean and tidy from the outside, that we'd always look messy and grimy. Um, and as long as we're messy and grimy, you guys will have me here. Uh, if we start getting clean and tidy, I'm looking for a new place. I don't think it's going to happen, so don't freak out, but I just like, it's got to be this messy. So let's praise God for that. Um, we're going to transition to a time where we sing uh, and we eat and we drink and we give. And so I just want to transition us to that time. We're going to eat and drink. So if you are here, our primary motivation for sharing the gospel is that the gospel's changed us. And so we celebrate that through the eating of bread, remembering what Christ has done on the cross in the drinking of wine or juice. Jesus told us, remember, I, I love this story. If you go back and read in John, J- Jesus told the disciples, hey, the Holy Spirit's going to come. He's going to help you remember. 
But then he takes them to dinner that night. He's like, but you guys got to remember. Don't forget. Remember. Like, he's like, he's serious about remembering. He's serious about remembering the cross. And so we come up and we remember the cross in the gospel through eating and drinking. Remembering that it's Christ's body that was broken for us and his blood that was spilt that washes us. Okay? And so we do that. So if you're a Christian, you want to come up, you can come up and you can come over, take the elements and take them back to your seat and pray a prayer of thanksgiving and, and, and partake and, um, and thank God for what he's done for you. If you're a member here at the Grove and you call the Grove home, this is our chance to give. And so we have a box up here uh, where you can give, on it, give in. If you're not a member this, or, you're, or you're new here, this isn't me asking for money. Um, but I hope that this s- service and this time here, this gathering was a gift to you. But if you're a member, you call us home. You can give online or you can give at the box here as you worship. Um, and then we'll sing. And we will sing a f- uh, three songs, just so you kind of know how much time's left. We'll sing three songs, have a time of announcements and prayer. Um, but man, I love you guys. Uh, I love the messiness of this church. I just, I just don't want to change. I'm going to pray for us, and then we'll get to singing and responding. Father God, I thank you so much for the story of Ephesus. Thank you for uh, pulling the curtain back for us to see its birth, its growth, its heartaches, um, and its warning, Father. And I just thank you for their example in the early years. I pray that we would learn from that and we would emulate that here at the Grove. Lord, I pray, God, that we would extol the name of Jesus. I pray, God, that we would confess and divulge our practices. We would have a, um, a culture of confession here at the Grove. And Father, I pray that we would grow in holiness as the word goes out and prevails mightily over the darkness. God, help us go out. Help us reach our community. Help us bring many more sons and daughters to glory. God, this isn't a private thing. This isn't just for us. We want to see the world changed. And we want to start in Spruce Pine and Burnsville. So help us, guide us, give us wisdom as we go out. Father, I love you. I thank you for the men and women here. And we pray this in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing.